I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. Okay, everybody. It's uh, it's going to be a really interesting one, Mac. You're sitting here uh, with us today. You've got always got a lot of questions. Next to you, we've got Mr. Bill Gibson, who's been around so long, you would think he's probably encountered a pieball at some point in time. Several. And then you know Tux is going to have some stories about pieball. As much as he's been hunting uh, all over South Alabama, up here in Mississippi, all over, I, I bet he's got some pieball stories. A little bit. But we've got, through the magic of of zoom dr steve ditchkoff from auburn university and he's going to tell us about these pieballs steve we're glad to have you here oh good morning guys it's great to be here appreciate the invite i was trying to think of something clever to say about auburn but uh tox was kind of cutting his eyes at me like Uh, he was expecting me to say something so i'm not going there we're for everybody we're agnostic for sure (laughs) <laughs> oh, me. Well, uh, look, look you're, you're a busy guy. We appreciate you taking time to do this. And uh, it, this is, you know, we're, we do a lot of times we're on these, uh, some of these podcasts, we're talking about real specific subjects. And l- last week we had Jimmy Styles and the, the alligator snapping turtle. That was really interesting. But we've all encountered and seen pictures of piebald deer. And we all, we all ask each other questions all the time, but none of us really have any really any solid information to go on. So before we start down the road of pie ball, Steve, I know I just kind of carried you up right to the edge and now I'm backing you back down. But guys, have y'all, our friend Kevin Van Dam, he's saying that the EHD is in South Michigan. Chris Paradise is saying they're seeing it in Northern Ohio. It seemed like it's traveled further North this year than in most years. Are y'all hearing that too? It's sporadic, and it's not like just a wave, you know, a couple hundred miles wide and across ten states type of thing. It's I think it's hot pockets and hot pockets and hot pockets. So evidently our deer in the south have been uh, uh, subjected to it so much more over history. They're more immune typically, they, although it still rolls through populations. Uh, and the further north you go, I guess they're less immune, and maybe his because of the – Summer's getting hotter. I don't know. It may be yeah. traveling further north. I know it's, I mean, Mark, I can remember Mark, you know, because we're so close, it's been 10 or 15 or more years ago, 20 years ago, talking about it, just almost wiping out his herd. And then, of course, the good news was it kind of did the management and reducing your carrying, you know, the, the load on your carrying capacity for you uh, in an ugly way. But in a couple of years, everything snaps back even better, usually. But it's so sad. Yeah. Kevin sent the video of one that had gotten to water but wasn't dead yet. It would just break your heart. Yeah, yeah Steve, what, do you, what can you tell us about EHD? Well, um, EHD is, is a natural disease that we have here, epizootic hemorrhagic disease um, here in the United States. It's, uh, it's spread by the Culicoides gnat. Culicoides is the genus. Um, there are essentially no seams right. is the way we think about it. Uh, there's multiple species of no seams. They, it, 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 they spread them to the deer. Humans are not susceptible to it, but deer are. Um, so EHD is kind of a sister disease to blue tongue. So anybody in the cattle industry is going to be familiar with blue tongue, um, where EHD is more impacts white-tailed deer. Um, you know, Toxy was right. You know, it's, there's, there's differences in susceptibility to EHD depending upon the latitude. If you go down to Florida, EHD rolls through almost every year, but there's very little die off because they're, they've been challenged every year going back thousands of years. If you come in latitudes like South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, um, it rolls through about every four to six years and there's moderate resistance. We have animals die, but there's not nearly the level of die offs that we find up north. About every 10 to 20 years, when you start getting into Ohio, Michigan, even up, up into the Dakotas, 
when it when it rolls through, it can be devastating in terms of the numbers of deer because there's little to no resistance to it, and it just you know, as you said, it, 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 you know, if you are un, unfortunate enough to kind of witness these animals, um, what happens is there, there's a lot of internal bleeding, you know, and, and the, the reactions you see of these deer, what they're, what they're doing is very similar to what you see a gut shot deer do, is they're going to water. They're dehydrated, they're going to water, and so you're frequently finding those animals dying next to water or near water. Hmm. So sad. Yeah. You know, Kevin's got that beautiful pond behind his oh, house. And I mean, to be, to be sitting there eating breakfast or whatever, look out your window and there, there'd be a buck staggering around. That's, yeah. that's tough to watch. Yeah. Is there anything you can do to prepare your herd for it? Uh, I, I don't think there is, you know, it's since the day I arrived here in the Auburn campus back in 2001, I was getting phone calls from, deer breeders you know back back in those days most of the genetics were from up north our, our deer breeders and so they were had genetics of ant from animals that were that were susceptible to ehd um in the last 20 25 years these deer breeders have been doing a lot of crossbreeding with southern lines that sort of thing to try and get animals that do not have the susceptibility to it and to increase the value of their stock but with wild herds there's nothing you can really do um you know, I know there's folks that, that have high fences that, that, that try and fog their properties with, with insecticides to try and impact, Oof. try and have a positive impact or fog their, their deer breeding operations. But, you know, the individuals that I talk to that really have their head on straight, you know, we'll, we'll all say they, they really don't think it's doing a lot of good. You just happen to be in an area that's more susceptible to it for whatever reason than maybe, you know, 15 miles down the road. Yeah, you know, those people are indiscriminately killing stuff like honeybees and whatever that doesn't need to happen either. So it probably exactly does, it does right. more harm than good. But yeah. uh, surely there's, it is, a. I heard you say this, I thought it, it is, a, it is a virus. It is a viral it, disease. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, immunity is, you know, largely from having had it before too in viruses. But uh, it seems like there would been some research done on, you know, a feed additive that maybe it, um, maybe you just there's a certain you know natural immunity you could build up you know who knows like in humans uh zinc you know helps in some cases to build up your natural immunity to viruses i don't know it's just really sad and um uh, um you know i guess you get just let nature take its course but it's so ugly people spend so much it's not just all the money to me that makes my heart hurt first of all because i'm a critter guy before anything y'all know that yeah i'm an animal lover and so to see something suffer like that, it's like just hard for me to talk about it. It's so sad. Yeah. But to see people now, they pour so much money, and that's actually not the most important thing, their time. You think about their limited time on earth. Someone spent years and years of their time in what they love the most, you know, outdoors, nature, trees, grasses, the property they have, and their proudest thing probably is their deer herd, and to see that get decimated. And that's kind of what's happened to kevin i mean he is a gamekeeper foremost beyond even the greatest fisherman of all time he really is that's what he loves he pours himself into it and i hate to even talk about it it's so tragic honestly you know the, i think the biggest thing is and i'm sure kevin's doing this on his property is is make sure your deer in good condition yeah um you know we don't we don't give enough we don't understand well enough these animals generally out the wild are living on the edge of undernutrition you know you talk about you and i how you know make sure that you're you're you know when we're sick we're warm we're we're well fed we're right, hydrated right. we're all of these things you know anything that we can do to make sure those animals are in good condition are going to positively affect their immune system and maybe get them over that hump yeah i'd always heard the hotter the summer the worse maybe but that could just be i didn't know if that was because they were in worse their that taps their immune system out a little worse or is it just because, you know, it has to get good and warm before these gnats? Yeah, I've, I haven't seen data on it. You know, I was, it's just, it's one of these things that's really hard to understand. You know, if you go up to Michigan, if it doesn't roll through it, but every 10 or 20 years, you know, the scientists yeah. just aren't prepared to go in there and, and even study it. And the tools that we have today, we didn't have 15, 20 years ago. And even to study it here in Mississippi or Alabama, you know, with it rolling through every four to six years, it's just, 
it, it's really hard to collect a data set that's sufficient to be able to answer those questions. So in Florida, they're exposed to it every year. So that generations, I mean, building that immunity. And then the, I guess the farther north you go, it's more sporadic. I mean, you know, for you, like in Mississippi and Alabama, it might be that gener each generation gets to see it. And then as you go north, I mean, that could be two or three generations separated. So it makes sense that it'd be hard to, to actually get that immunity in the herd. Yeah, well, so Kevin, man, we're thinking about all you guys up north that, that are experiencing that. We're thinking about you. And look, before we go on, golly, boy, the folks that got caught up in uh, Hurricane Helene, we our hearts go out to you. Some tough times. I, know I mean, this is, we're laying this on a Tuesday, and tomorrow a potentially worse one is supposed to hit down further in Florida, yep. right on Tampa. I mean, yeah. our prayers. It will have happened by the time people hear this, but I mean, you have all our prayers. Uh, I just got to give a shout out to people, you know, all over. It's just, an, it's amazing when the stuff happens. I just, our buddy Luke Combs, he and uh, Eric Church are putting on a big con a benefit concert next week. I mean, which is going to be just millions and millions to charity for the Carolinas. I think it's a concert for Carolina is the name of it. But anyway, there's just such an outpouring of goodwill and love and care and servant spirit of people. It's just amazing. I got to shout out to Cuz. Because he is a warrior, he always has been. He drove a truck over there, like last Friday, and he's still there working with yeah. people in law enforcement. And uh, he talked to law enforcement and game wardens over there, and they got him into like the worst town that needed it the most. And he's there helping. He's been sending video out of there, and uh, you know he's not doing to get any kind of attention. He's just a warrior in times like this, and I appreciate that. And we've actually um, some other people working. I want to call out Kylie. She's helped a lot too. Uh, and there's others, but it just makes me so proud to see our own family and all these other people we know just pouring their self. There's so many companies and so many private individuals doing so much to help. And guess what? We better gear up to do it again. By the time this airs, yeah. we'll have two of those on our hands. So yeah. prayers and cares for everybody out there. Those are good words, Toxie. Thank you for saying them. Let's turn our attention. We... Uh, Steve, we want to learn about piebald deer. What can, can start off and just kind of help us understand what we're what it is what it is that makes a deer a piebald. A piebald deer is, is kind of a rare genetic anomaly. I've heard descriptions that it's a genetic mutation. I've heard descriptions that it's a it's it's a recessive gene, but it, it's genetically driven, and you get animals that display different degrees of of the symptoms of being piebald. Um, the most common symptom that, that most people are aware of is it's essentially, it's a white spotted deer. It's a deer with a normal coat that has areas on the body that are where you have white fur. Um, and it's important to differentiate that this is different than albinism. An, an animal that's an albino, it's a recessive genetic allele that essentially said there, there, there's, there's, no, there's no melanism in the skin to be able to make the hair dark. And it also gives, you also find pink eyes in an animal that's, that's a true albino. Um, an animal that's piebald, and it can be more than just deer, they have this white spotting. Those are normally the ones that we see. You'll see an, a, a, a hunter has harvested one, or you'll see a, a picture of one at somebody's feeder. Um, what we generally don't see are any pictures of deer that have extreme cases of, of of, of being piebald. And in those cases, they're, 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 there's a lot of other symptoms that come along with that spotted coat. Hey guys, listen up. Let me tell you about an awesome deal Springfield Armory is offering now through the end of 2024. When you purchase a brand new model 2020 Waypoint or Redline rifle, you'll receive a model 2020 Rimfire rifle with a black synthetic stock absolutely free. That's an over $400 value on the house. You know we love Springfield Armory and their top-notch products you'd be proud to hand down to your kids and grandkids. So why wait? Learn more about this incredible offer at GearUp2024.com. Springfield Armory. Defend your legacy. See these people? When the clock strikes five, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. They have to do these things. They have to do those things. 
Enter the all-new LS Tractor MT2 and MT2E, a relentless force of innovation. Redesigned with a new hood and cab built for comfort and visibility, with enhanced lifting capacity to get the job done. Making these people the ones everyone else calls those people. Visit your local LS Tractor dealer today. Is it uh, possible that some of those other symptoms are due to another allele, another recessive gene, as opposed to the piebald gene? Have they specifically identified the piebald gene that causes that? Yeah, it's my understanding that 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 that, that it's linked there. Um, and 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 what you're finding is they, they talk about kind of a kind of a bowed nose, and so there's some deformities there, kind of in the muzzle area. Um, there can be um, a, a some issues with maybe I think it's a, I believe it's a shortened lower jaw. So now you've got issues with the teeth not coming together properly to be able to grind food. Um, scoliosis is pretty common in some of these extreme cases, and you'll start to see shortening of the legs, or they almost look pigeon-toed, where you'll see bowing of the legs. But there's, it's hard on a it's hard on a healthy fawn that's born out there. When you take one that is spotted and white, it makes it harder on them. And when you start to give them any sort of physical deformities, it's almost impossible for them to survive more than a day or two. I'm just wondering if, if possibly the bowed legs, the uh, spinal problems that, that you see, and all those things are not SD2, skeletal dysplasia too, because we see it in dog populations. And uh, it's a specific gene that's been identified mm -hmm. And then if you if you breed like a pie ball to a pie ball, they say you don't get all pie balls. If you breed a dog with that carries one one specific gene or allele, and the, other, the mate has that same allele, then you get all affected out of it. And I've read where pie balls you might get one pie ball if you breed in a similar manner. And I'm just wondering about that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I'm really not familiar with 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 the genetics of it, and I'm not yeah. quite sure how much it's been studied. You know, the 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 the, the research I've done and in the in the digging I've done through the literature really hasn't described it very well in terms of exactly what the genetic characteristics of it are, other than the fact that the numbers that I've seen that 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 say you know two percent prevalence or something like that, I I find surprising. That it's th that it's that high. Although I do, I am familiar with some populations around the country where, you know, there is a fairly decent prevalence of it. So, Steve, can if you're a guy and you've got a, a hunting club and you, and you all end up getting a picture of one of these, is it an animal that, that that we should target and try to take out, or or just enjoy it and see what it turns into? I know there's some states that have laws that say, and I, and I can't remember which states they are. There's one that I, that, that I read about that says, if it's more than 50% white, it's illegal to shoot. There was another state I saw that says it's, if it's more than 75% white, it's illegal to shoot. So, I mean, first of all, you know, we don't want to make a mistake and, you know, end up with a, with, 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 a, with a game violation, but with regards to harvesting it, you know, I think it, I think it depends upon the individual. You know, removing that individual is not going to have any impacts on the population whatsoever. Um, it's, it's you're not really changing the genetics in that population. The genes are still present in the population. Leaving it there is not going to increase the prevalence of it. Taking it out is not going to decrease it. Mm -hmm. I guess it becomes down to, you know, the, 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 the feelings of that individual hunter. You know, is it more important to see that deer out there in the woods, which which a lot of hunters really get, you know, the enjoyment from seeing the animals. And there's other individuals that get the enjoyment of, you know, taking it home, for lack of a better term. And so it's, yeah, I, I, I'm, la I'm never going to tell, you know, another hunter what, what, what deer they should get enjoyment out of harvesting. And so, you know, I, th I think it just depends upon, you know, them personally. Have, have you encountered many of them yourself in your hunting career? I've never seen one hunting. Um, I've seen them, you know, I know there's, there's a, there's a pretty strong population of, of them up around university of Maine, university of Maine and Orno Maine is on an Island in the middle of the Penobscot river. And there's a fairly high prevalence in that population. So it's not uncommon to see it in those deer. 
I mean, nothing like 50% or anything like that. I mean, low percentage still, but it, but it's fairly common. And I've always thought it's because of the river bounding it on both sides. While the, while the deer can swim the river, it is forming somewhat of a barrier. Um, but I've never seen it in an individual. Um, I've seen it in a crow, but I've never, you know, in, in the wild, and I've seen it in those deer, but never while deer hunting. What about elk and, and moose? Does this pop up in, in, in them? It, 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 I know, and I don't know the, the full list of species that it's been described in. Um, my guess is you're going to see lower prevalence rates in some of those populations that are, have greater exposure to some of the large predators, it's just because there's going to be such a, such a visual with that white fur. So Iowa protects piebald deer with more than 50% white hair and uh, Montana protects deer with more than 75%. Never heard of that. Wow. Hmm. Toxie, th- through all the years down in South Alabama up here, have you, have you encountered many? I uh, think I've seen one killed by somebody. I've, there was a couple in the camp I grew up hunting in. There was two different ones that had been mounted that were up on the wall that were piebald partially. Um I've seen in the wild, I saw uh, out there where our cabin is here, I saw one cross the road several times. He was a year and a half old, like four point. And then I never, I'm sure someone just shot him, unfortunately, sadly, because I never saw him again after that. But that was pretty exciting because it was a buck. And I've seen probably three or four, maybe five does in the wild that were, I've never seen one that was like over 75, but they were definitely pie balls. Hey, 30 to 70 percent maybe white on them and it was just cool i'd normally see about one a year is that right yeah and uh but it's they're like more like 20 to 30 percent where he hunts is very close to what i'm talking about you know you don't but phoebe's what i was talking about yeah i hunt Lion Lion creek yeah so he's not but a few miles from where an area that seems like i just hear about them more often uh, maybe because we live here but yeah and i see uh I do. I see at least one a year, and I might see that one, you know, a couple of times from right. a stand. But, Mostly uh, does. Yeah, all does. Well, I've never would, seen a buck. I think people get trigger happy about the bucks, even when they're. And you know what? Up. I let the does walk. Mm-hmm. And people say, well, you shouldn't do that. Bad genetics in the no. herd. You should take it out yep. because you improve the genetics. And I kind of like dogs. Uh, we get dogs with white spots, and they're just as good as the ones that don't have white spots. I mean, spots. to me, they're, they're so beautiful. Yeah. If that was the case, if genetics, would they could be passed along. I'd, I'd let them go because of that instead of killing them, you know. That's why I do it. Yep. And I don't see any problem with it because I've never seen mm-hmm. one that was bow-legged or, or any obvious spinal problems or anything else. And like I say, that, I attribute that to spinal dysplasia, too, in dogs. Right. Short legs. Uh, bowed legs, a uh, little spinal hump, and things like that. But in, in the dog population, if you have a white spot, it's hard to sell. Right. It's People, amazing, yeah. And, and they're, they're just as smart. Yeah. They're just as trainable, just as biddable as anything else. So that's why I let the deer walk. I don't think it's a real problem. Right. Steve, is there anything else about these that we need to – any questions we're not asking? No, I think it's – you know, I think one of the biggest things, you know, the take home is if that animal, number one is you're not going to change the prevalence of that genetics in the herd by shooting it out. Um, whether you're trying to change the genetics in your herd with regards to antlers or some characteristics, all the studies show that despite all of our efforts by pulling the trigger to alter her genetics it's kind of like spitting in the ocean you're raising sea level but you're not doing it by any measurable degree and and, and so you know if, if it makes you happy to harvest it harvest it but it's just it's something that's there and you know i think you know you guys have mentioned it you know well it, it, it's a beautiful animal it, it's 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 something that's unique and, and and one of the it's one of the beautiful things we get to see when we when we spend time in the woods when we go out there that just it's just a part of nature, and it's yeah. beautiful. Rare. Well, I tell you, I, I don't think I've ever through the – I mean, I, we, we pulled up an article. We've been looking at a bunch of different pictures, and there's a couple of pictures of some really nice bucks, piebald bucks, uh, but that, that's probably the rarest of all of them. But I don't recall ever seeing uh, any pictures of a piebald elk. Do you, Mike? No. I, I don't. 
that's hmm, that's interesting. You ask me, I me neither. I haven't. Have you? Never. And, never, uh, never, you never, know, never I, for me. I hunted Colorado 15 straight years, never seen a piebald mule deer or a piebald elk. Here in the United States, as we have really moved deer genetics around in the eastern U.S. And so, it, it, you know, 70 years ago, it may have been something that was more localized regionally. We weren't aware of it just because it wasn't being documented then. Right. But with the restocking efforts across the southeast, you know, it, that could be the reason why we're finding it more in some locations than others. The fact that we were just happened to be bringing in genetics from some places where, where it was prevalent. We just happened to grab a deer that, that, that had those genetics. Hmm. You know, when you were reintroducing back then, and if you were reintroduced an area in Mississippi with 15 deer, and if two of them, you know, had those genetics, then you're looking at approximately 15% of your population had it at that time. And so you could have areas that are high prevalence rate just because of the restocking efforts, historical. Hey, Lanny. Hey, Bobby. Have you ever wondered if your feeder went off? Or if it's even got corn in it? Yeah, you sit there at night wondering about it. Moultrie has solved this. This is some high-tech stuff. Fits on any feeder that helps monitor the level of feed and lets you know if it went off or not. And you can remotely control it. Can I look at your feeder if we're on the hub? I really hope not, but we're going to have to talk to the guys at Moultrie about that. This is the biggest thing in feeders since corn. That's saying a lot. With Feed Hub, there's no more stressing, no more guessing. This technology allows you to remotely monitor your feeders. You know, we always say feed safely, do it the right way. No doubt about it. To learn more about it, visit MoultrieProducts.com backslash Feed Hub. It's a great invention. Unbelievable technology and products brought to us by our buddies at Moultrie. You know that article that we were just looking through, Richie was. Bump, there's a blacktail deer in there with it. So, there, there, there's 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 a Western example right there. So, so uh, Steve, is it true or false? Uh, panda in Chinese means piebald. I don't know. He takes <laughs> such great pride in humiliating people. That's not humiliating. No, I, I don't know the answer to that. That's question. when you enjoy it the most. Is what I'm well, I, I just, I just, right? I enjoy right? seeing that I, look. I, I, that well, he what had, what like, is one of us? You do, I, say. He, I mean, I to be honest with you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me um, when you're talking about a black and white animal and it being spotted white. Um, I don't know that it is. You know, I know, I know, pied. If you, if you go around the world, they start talking about pied crows and pot, different pied species. It's black and white. So maybe, I don't know. So I think pied comes from magpie, right? And then yep. the bald comes from like white, you know, a spot of white, like in horses, like spotted horses. Mm -hmm. Thank so it's you, Mr. Noah. Pie ball. I mean, that's where it comes from. So Is could horses be pie bald? I don't know the answer. I know it's. I know that. I know there's a number of species that can be, and it lists. But the, the the lists I read through it didn't obviously didn't list them all. I don't know that, but I don't know that it would make sense in a horse because there's so many different variations that have the yes. different colors. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, Steve. Before we let you go, we do have a legit trivia question for you. I have one question before the trivia. Well, go ahead. So, <clears throat> pie pieball deer seem to be more prevalent than deer with the the front upper fangs is that a real like what how often do you see that and what causes that genetic mutation you, you asked two questions there you're only allowed one okay um, all right so uh well, what causes the second question i mean the second part of it i don't know the genetic basis for it um but you know deer you know Back in the back in the evolution of deer, I mean, they had upper canines, and you see that displayed sometimes. We generally don't look for it, you know. Obviously, we have it in elk. We call them the whistling teeth, but you don't see those upper canines very often in deer. Occasionally, if you look, you will find them. Um, but it, it's 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 no different than than finding a vestigial tail in humans. You know, there are some humans that have a little bit more with regards to the tailbone. Um, and there's something there, but I don't understand the genetic foundation for it. Now I have never heard that. It's, it's been in, it's been in some movies. So uh, look, Doc, this trivia may may or may not be in your wheelhouse. So we'll excuse you if it. But but I thought, based on the amount of hurricane activity, this is something that our listeners could learn something from. All right. So uh, uh, the listen the winner today is 
TLM4590 is uh, the listener who uh, left a review. Yeah, what'd he win? So he won a Moultrie scale to, uh, to weigh his deer. Oh, that's so, good. That's cool. Uh, so, yeah, get, for a chance to, to win, leave a review and uh, get all these uh, different prizes from uh, Toxie's Closet. There we go. Mm-hmm. They have emptied in my closet so long ago. My closet is a ghost town. To yeah, it really is. So the doc is now playing for a Companions t-shirt. So There you go, doc. All right. So the question is, as Bobby said, you know, we're, we're paying attention to the hurricanes. Do hurricanes ever develop and cross between the northern and southern hemispheres? Do they cross the equator? So if one forms out there in the northern hemisphere, does it ever cross to the southern or vice versa? I don't believe so, because I believe the Coriolis effect is going to negatively impact that. How about that? That is exactly right. It it could try, but it can't. Yes. Isn't that fascinating? Yep. So there's an image that uh, that I found that shows, goes back like 40 years, where all these Hurricane Richard probably will, Doc. Uh, don't they spin in the opposite direction in the southern hemisphere? Yeah, a low pressure system spins counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, and it spins counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. I thought clockwise. that was just toilet bowls. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing though? Yeah. And they they <laughs> they can't cross the the equa- equator. Right. Well, they could try. I think I was shot. Uh, can't uh, uh, the just, Coriolis effect that mm-hmm. uh, that you you impressed us, Doc. All right, so he wins a T-shirt, Richie. We'll have to get that out there to him. Can you put him back on the screen? We'd, I'd like to see him smile. He doesn't smile very often. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe we got You just want to see his logo. Him. You're, you're, you're <laughs> lusting over his logo as you got on. <laughs> no. Hey, the Coriolis effect. That was in class a long time ago. That's, that's exactly what it is. I'm really impressed. Wow. wow did talk- you, Tosh, did you know that? Mm-hmm. Dude, I'm like, they call me Little Willard. I've been nicknamed that for 25 years. You do pay attention to the weather a yep. lot. So. Yep. I'm a weather nut. All right. Well, uh, so, Doc, guys can uh, – listeners, there might be young people thinking about going to school. What all do you teach up? What all, What is your role over there? What could you say about somebody young wanting to go to school? Well, you know, I'm a professor in the wildlife program here at Auburn University. Um, it's like – like the rest of the land grant universities, Mississippi State, University of Georgia, University of Florida, Tennessee, um, has a very strong wildlife program. Um, we're very proud of what we do here. Um, in addition, we have a wildlife pre-vet program, but more recently we have, about six years ago, we developed our wildlife enterprise management program, which is um, the second of its kind in the country. Um, I would argue it's the best in the country right now. And essentially what it is, it's hunting and fishing lodge management. Um, we're training students. It's a third wildlife, a third hospitality, and a third business and marketing um, with training the next generation of managers for outdoor recreation lodges, um, focusing on mostly on consumptive use on hunting and fishing. Hmm. So that's unique. Teach a multitude of Impressive. classes there, but anybody interested in, you know, Auburn University, you know. You know Where's the other one? Kansas State had the, had the original wow. program. We kind of looked at what they were doing and took what we thought was what they were doing good and we built upon that and now we're getting a lot of calls from other universities that are that are developing programs yeah and they're uh, you're in a hotbed too you're in geographically you're in a great location well it's we're really proud of of, of what's happened with it we've made some connections with some really really strong um hunting and fishing lodge some partners in the industry um you know, High Adventure Company is is probably at the top of the list, and they've got just five star world class <clears> lodges <throat> around the world. And so our students are able to are really awesome. going out during spring and fall semesters, taking a year off, and um, doing internships, getting experience, and just seeing the world. It's it's been what an amazing exciting career. You know, similar to that, many many years ago, Mississippi State was the first one to. You could major in being a game board. I don't know what it's called. You literally could major. You left. You're ready to go. And so, state of Mississippi just started trying to get every single part. They couldn't not hire others, but they were really wanting the the kids, male and female both, that have gotten through that. They were just so ready to go. And I guarantee you, this same thing. People were more and more start to look here first because they're ready to go right out of school. Plus, anybody majors in either one of those is following their passion. And I will say it all day long great career best career advice 
you'll ever get is just find what you really, what God puts you here to do, what you love. You can't wait to get going in the morning because you love it so much. And if someone majors in that, that's what they love. So yeah. they're going to they're gonna be perfect for someone to hire. Yeah, yeah, they would. So, Doc, uh, th- this past year we did a the, uh, the television show with you on wild pig management. Did you ever get much feedback to, uh, when you're traveling around the community? Yeah, it's, you know, I think the most interesting part is, is, is the students in class is we get students in class, we get incoming freshmen and it's just like, oh my goodness, I saw you on this podcast. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always, I'm always amazed at the reach that, that these podcasts have. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of young outdoors folks, you know, young men and women, boys and girls that are watching these podcasts that are really you know, taken to heart the things that are being said and, you know, and what you guys are showing to them. And so, you know, I'd say, you know, keep up the good work. I mean, you're inspiring, you know, the, the future outdoors men and women in this country. The Furminator is the industry's most versatile piece of food plot equipment, allowing plotters to do every step of the process, working the soil, adding seed and soil supplements, and compacting from start to finish with a single implement. It's hassle-free by design. Set it for the seed size and simply drive the tractor and the Furminator does the rest. Check it out at theferminator.com. Nosler is known for their bullets and now they're making suppressors. Nosler suppressors are made for hunting. Adding a Nosler suppressor to your rifle will make you a quieter, more accurate and more effective hunter. Protect your hearing and disturb less game with a Nosler suppressor. The time to hunt quiet is now. Learn more at Nosler.com. You know, it fits it for today's fast moving world. It, it does. And, and the technology we have. It fits a great spot in communication today. And but we take that responsibility very, very seriously. So and if I could smile a little bit more, we might get ratings up. <laughs> yeah, you're so uh, you're so serious looking all the time. Goodness gracious! Yeah, it's just it's just it's it's a character flaw. I don't know what to say. <laughs> well, we enjoyed having you. We appreciate it, guys. Before uh, we close this thing out, uh, there's a little blood on the biologic. There's a young lady in Tennessee named Chloe Daniel that killed her first deer with a bow and arrow last week. And How about that? Uh, so I'm real proud of her. I thought that was that was really neat. And uh, Mac, did you have anybody? Hunter Krim. That's right. That's right. Right here in uh, in Columbus. Yep. That, that was a really nice buck he killed. So so there's Chloe right there. Look at that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great picture. That is a great picture. All right, guys. Well, look, this has been a lot of fun. We sure appreciate you listening to the podcast. Uh, leave us a review. You get a chance to win something out of Toxic Closet. There's still a little bit of stuff left in there. Mr. Bill, we appreciate you coming in here, sitting I down. I appreciate the invite. Yeah. Mac? You messed up my nap, but yeah. I, I enjoyed it. Yep. Toxic's trying to get a nozzler suppressor, I understand. That's what mm-hmm. made you a little late this mm-hmm. morning, getting that paperwork done. So, Well, Dr. Steve Ditchkoff, we appreciate it. We'll look forward to talking to you again about, about some interesting subject matter in the future. I hey, appreciate the invite. Look forward to doing it again. Good to see you, Doc. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you guys, too. All right, Mac, I'm going to look at you. Why don't you say goodbye, Mac? Goodbye, Bobby. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.